Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This is my full Guardians of the Galaxy 3 breakdown and Easter eggs for the entire movie. There's a ton of references and a lot of teasers for future Marvel movies like Avengers 5, Kang Dynasty, Secret Wars. There's so much stuff to talk about. So if you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. We're also still doing that special Guardians of the Galaxy giveaway. All you have to do to enter that is just be a subscriber and leave your favorite moment from the movie on the video. Careful for spoilers for the movie if you haven't seen it yet because we'll be talking about everything, but the first major thing is that this is meant to be James Gunn's final Marvel movie. He was hired by Warner Brothers last year, famously becoming the new Kevin Feige of DC movies basically, rebooting all of DC movies. His first official movie as part of that will be the new Superman Legacy movie. I've already done a bunch of separate videos about that so I'll link those in the description below because it's like a whole separate thing. But just because he's leaving doesn't mean this is the end of the Guardians of the Galaxy team. The team will continue, as they say during the post credit scenes, like that's the whole point at the end of the movie, is to let you know that the Guardians will continue in future movies. Disney already said that they're not going to do fourth sequels for any of the movie franchises anymore that don't have Avengers in the titles of those movies, so that's why they'll do Avengers movies to the heat death of the universe, but like no more Thor Love and Thunders, nobody's getting a fourth movie for the most part. The next big place we'll see the Guardians team though will be Avengers, Kang Dynasty, or Secret Wars, at least one of those movies. It's also the reason why they introduced so many big new characters like Adam Warlock and Phi Lavelle, the female version of Quasar. And why at the end of the movie literally says the legendary Star-Lord will return because he will return in the next Avengers movie. That's one of the reasons why he ends the movie on Earth where the other Avengers will be. The actual movie begins with a cold open scene of Rocket's origin story. It's pretty haunting. The High Evolutionary reaches his hand into a cage Rocket has been living in with a batch of his brothers and sister raccoons and selects him to be the next in his batch 89 experiment, his 89th attempt at creating the perfect life form. At the end of the movie, things come full circle when Rocket goes to confront him and they wind up rescuing all the caged animals. Rocket also finally learns that he is in fact a raccoon, which he'd been denying this whole time. Now he knew what raccoons were, but I think part of the idea is that he suppressed the trauma of his origin story so much that he just forgot that he was a raccoon. Like he was evolved without seeing the raccoon name written anywhere, so he never thought about himself as being a raccoon. And if it wasn't clear, the cage that he sees at the end of the movie with the other baby raccoons is meant to be the exact same cage that High Evolutionary pulled him from at the beginning of the movie. And all the raccoons that are living here would be his distant descendants. Now raccoons only live for a couple years and Rocket Raccoon is meant to be about 15 years old in the MCU. So these raccoons would be like his great grand nieces and great grand nephews. But basically all the baby raccoons that he rescues are related to him distantly. They play the Marvel intro scene and there's another major change to the way they do intros. They give him a special intro, kind of like the Black Panther Chadwick Boseman intro and the special Stan Lee intro during the first Captain Marvel movie. All the pictures in the logo are all the Guardians characters in different scenes from the previous Guardians movies. They also do not play the Marvel fanfare during the opening just because the tone of the opening scene is so dark and serious. They start playing a stripped down version of Creep by Radiohead as they go to nowhere and show a long montage of showing what the Guardians of the Galaxy are doing right now in present day. And the scene follows Rocket's perspective as he's walking past all the different Guardians. The major reason why they do this is because the movie is largely from Rocket's perspective. Now it is an ensemble, all the different characters have their own arcs. Peter Quill, obviously one of the main characters of the Guardians, but the way James Gunn talks about it, he said that Rocket is written to be the secret protagonist of all the Guardians movies. I think from the beginning, Rocket was my entry into the Guardians in terms of creatively. You know, when Marvel first came to me and they talked to me about perhaps doing this movie, I wasn't certain, I thought maybe it would come off like Bugs Bunny in the middle of the <laughs> Avengers or something silly like that. And as I was driving home from the meeting, I sat there and I said, well, wait a second, if there was a raccoon that was, you know, talking and shooting people with machine guns, how would it have come to be? And I realized it was just the saddest story that I could imagine. Yeah. And that was for me the seeds of the entire franchise that have, you know, driven all three movies and the special and everything else they've done. Even though the way that Marvel has marketed the Guardians teams and all the Guardians movies, they make it seem like Peter Quill's Star-Lord is the main character. Technically, James Gunn is saying that it's meant to be Rocket has always been the main character. 
You also notice in this movie, they start with a moment on Rocket and they end with Rocket becoming Captain of the Guardians. The sign Nebula is hanging up is based on the Guardians of the Galaxy 3 logo from the movie. The language is written in Cree. Anytime you see these foreign characters, it's all over nowhere. Pretty much all the languages that are written are written in Cree because Nowhere's head is in Cree space. Like they've been living in Cree space this whole time because that's near where Xandar is, where the Nova Corps was. A lot of people asking if there was going to be an Easter egg for Nova in this movie too, just because they have such a connection with the Nova Corps in the previous movies. There was a deleted scene during Infinity War where they address what happened to the Nova Corps being destroyed by Thanos before the events of the movie. It was basically like a 15 minute deleted scene of him destroying the Nova Corps. They were supposed to set up the origin story for Nova. He was supposed to be a character during Infinity War and Endgame, but they just wound up being too much stuff and they gave a lot of that plot to the Captain Marvel character. There's been talk about doing a special presentation, like a one-off movie for Nova or a TV series. We'll see what they wind up doing with the character. You notice Rocket is using Peter Quill's Zune, setting up the twist at the end of the movie where he gives him the Zune along with leadership of the Guardians. The lyrics of the Creep song are mostly a reference to Rocket and the way that he feels about himself. Like he feels like he is a creep and the movie is largely him coming to terms with his tragic backstory and becoming less of a creep. The lyrics are also a reference to Peter Quill, who's been acting like a creep, literally lately getting drunk all the time. His character arc is similar to Rocket's, and he finally has to reckon with the death of his mother, his tragic backstory, the loss of Gamora, and goes to spend time living on Earth. He passes Cosmo, who's fighting Kraglin for something she wants to chew on. They kind of set the two of them up in the movie as a pair like Drax and Mantis, who become closer friends with each other than the rest of the other Guardians. Like, they're a pair within the Guardians, but just as good friends. I couldn't read the label on Peter Quill's space booze. There might be an Easter egg there, but the super deep cut Easter egg for Rocket's drink is that he grabs milk out of the fridge. The fridge says milk in Cree outside. Apparently it's popular enough drink on Nowhere that they give space milk its own fridge. But the Easter egg is for the Bova character because you talk about cows, milk. She was also one of the first creations of the High Evolutionary in the comics, who is the main villain in the movie. They reference her during WandaVision because Bova helped Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver when they were babies. And in the comics, there's a big connection between Scarlet Witch and High Evolutionary. They were born to Magna and Magneto. She fled to Mount Wondegore, which was where the High Evolutionary's base was on Earth at the time, where Bova then helped them briefly, placing them in the foster care of the Maximovs, which is why they don't have Magneto's Lencher last name. There are rumors about Marvel having some Easter eggs for Magneto being Scarlet Witch's father and their daughter relationship during Deadpool 3 in like an alternate universe where we might see Ian McKellen's Magneto become the father of Elizabeth Olsen's Scarlet Witch, but we'll see. Elizabeth Olsen has said in real life that if she had a preference for which version of Magneto would become her father, it'd be the Ian McKellen version, not the younger Michael Fassbender version of the character. When Peter Quill starts yelling at Rocket for stealing his Zune, he sets up the raccoon twist later, calling him a raccoon, Rocket denying it, but then later finds out, oh, he was right the whole time. I've been a raccoon this whole time. They explain that he's been getting blackout drunk just because he's so depressed over Gamora since the events of the holiday special. They don't say how long has passed since the holiday special, but I believe because most MCU movies move in real time this way, it's been at least like five, six months since the holiday special. And I believe this is meant to be taking place in the year 2026 within the MCU. I think we're into 2026 at this point. When you see his apartment, you notice the remains of his wooden tape player from the Milano ship are above his bed. They salvaged it from the ship after it was destroyed in the second movie. On the title card for Nowhere, it reads it's the Guardian's headquarters. So even though everyone kind of goes their separate ways at the end of the movie, Rocket's Guardian's team will still use Nowhere as its home base. It's just that Peter Quill is taking a break temporarily, as are Nebula, Drax, Mantis. So they're still Guardians, but some of them aren't on active duty. They purchased Nowhere from the Collector after Avengers Endgame, which confirms that the Collector survived Avengers Infinity War. We all kind of thought that Thanos killed him the old-fashioned way, not snapping him, but like literally just killing him with his bare hands, but apparently not. Rocket playing with his zero-gravity boots while he's talking to Nebula after this is also meant to foreshadow how he defeats the High Evolutionary at the end of the movie. High Evolutionary uses his telekinetic powers to fling him around the room. Rocket just turns on his gravity boots to stop him from doing that, enabling him to start landing shots on him. When they're explaining the Gamora problem, if you don't remember, she's the version from 2014 that time traveled with Thanos during Avengers Endgame. She wasn't snapped by Iron Man with the rest of Thanos' forces. They never explained why, but because she's from 2014, before the events of the first Guardians movie happened, 
She never met Peter Quill or the other Guardians and had none of that character arc, so she barely even remembers who Peter Quill is, which they joke about during the movie like, who are you again? There's a couple jokes about that during the movie, like the legendary Star-Lord joke, which is a callback to the first movie where nobody knew who he was. He wasn't that famous, even though he referred to himself as legendary. Star-Lord. Who? Well, Star-Lord, man. Legendary outlaw. The younger version of Gamora is kind of like that new variant version of Loki. The reason why the TVA didn't prune Gamora after Endgame is because whatever she did didn't create a Nexus event. And Nexus events are basically things that happen that lead to the rise of alternate timelines with dangerous variants of Kang. So even if you do something crazy with time travel, if it doesn't lead to a future evil version of Kang, like another Kang variant, then they won't stop you from doing whatever it is you're doing. Which is why all the Avengers were allowed to do the time travel heist in Avengers Endgame. But now because He Who Remains is dead, all of that's moot, it doesn't matter anymore. They have a bunch of jokes about somebody on the team taking one for the team and just jerking Peter Quill off, touching him quote unquote in that way. That always got a big laugh in my theater both times I saw it. Then we meet Adam Warlock for the first time who arrives flying through the vacuum of space without needing a breathing device which sets up him saving Peter Quill at the end of the movie without needing one just plucking him out of the vacuum of space. The song he flies in on is Crazy On You by Hard because he does go crazy on Rocket. He's here because he's ordered though by Ayesha and tangentially the High Evolutionary to bring Rocket back because High Evolutionary views him as his intellectual property and he's obsessed with why he's so unique. Why he's the only creation in all of his many experiments who's shown any kind of ability at creative thought. Even though High Evolutionary has created much more powerful advanced beings like Adam Warlock and Phi Lavelle. The other huge surprise of the movie is probably that Evolutionary created the entire sovereign race on a pure whim, only for aesthetic purposes like, oh, you know, I wanted to create something that looked cool, but otherwise they serve no real purpose for him. Which is why he so casually says that he'll wipe their entire race if they prove to be useless in obtaining Rocket. Like, I don't care about any of you, you're just there, so I'm going to use you, but if you fail, you're all dead. So in the MCU, High Evolutionary is the person who created Adam Warlock. He refers to him as the Warlock, which Adam Warlock does too. I'm supposed to be the Warlock, mother. I'm done listening to people. It was Ayesha who gave him the Adam part of his name. In the comics, it was someone on Counter Earth, but it kind of goes that way too. When he debuted in the comics, he was just called the Warlock. It wasn't until he came to Counter Earth that someone started calling him Adam Warlock. There are a lot of Easter eggs for his origin story in the comics. Originally, Adam Warlock was created by a race of humans called the Enclave, who just made him to fight other superheroes on Earth like the Avengers. He rebels and chooses to explore the universe and learn about morality on his own. The funny thing too is that he debuted in the Fantastic Four comics. We're getting ready to see the MCU version of the Fantastic Four, so we'll see if there's any kind of crossover in the future between those characters. But his arc in those original comics are similar to his arc in the movie. He's kind of like Vision in that he's an ultra-powerful being who was born yesterday, kind of like a baby in a god's body, who then leaves to sort of discover morality on his own. They mostly use him for comedy in the movie, more than they ever use Vision for comedy. But in the comics, he's more of like a David Bowie space Jesus kind of figure. Like, there's a lot more religiosity built into his character, especially with the counter-Earth arc. A lot of references to the biblical Adam and Eve storyline. Eventually, he meets High Evolutionary on Counter-Earth who forms a contract with him to kill Man-Beast, one of his animal-human hybrid creations who's taken control of Counter-Earth and upgrades him with the Soul Gem. That's how he gets it in the comics. In the movie, Adam Warlock has a gem in his forehead, but it's not the Soul Gem, obviously. The reason he's after Rocket in the movie, why he tries to kill most of the Guardians who get in his way, is only because he thinks if he doesn't get Rocket, High Evolutionary will kill his mother Ayesha in the rest of his entire race. So he has no actual feelings whatsoever about the Guardians personally until Groot winds up saving him. Before he attacks Rocket for the first time, Rocket looks at the key card that he MacGyvered together when he was younger to escape High Evolutionary, which he also winds up using at the end of the movie to free his raccoon descendants and the rest of the cage animals. The way he pulls it out of his holster, it also seems like he's kept that key card on him the same way ever since his escape. We get to see some of Nebula's upgrades in action. She's gone full on Battle Angel Nebula with a pair of wings and Rocket actually gave her her new arm that she's using, which she can morph into any type of tool or weapon that she needs. We also get to see some of Groot's new powers too. He has a bunch of different powers during the movie as his body has continued to evolve. 
it's way stronger just in general. He can also continue to survive with only a fraction of his body. Adam Warlock destroys pretty much everything but his head, which Crab walks back to the Guardians later. He can also regrow his body relatively quickly. He's got his full body back within about an hour or so of the movie. He can grow wings, which he can use to glide. He can expand his body, making himself appear huge. They're referring to that as like kaiju form of Groot. And when Vin Diesel calls him Alpha Groot, I think that he's mostly referring to Groot's final adult form in the post credit scene, where he reaches his final boss form, like the Giga Chad version of Groot. You also see later in the movie, too, where he can extend a bunch of different limbs, all manipulating them like he has many, many hands, all firing weapons. But the other major reveal about Groot was that he can actually talk with normal sentences, like speak normal, regular, full sentences. At the end of the movie, he says, I love you guys. Earlier in the movie, they had a bunch of jokes where Gamora thought that they were all just making up stuff that he said and pretended like they could understand him. But the whole reason why they have to seek out High Evolutionary to save Rocket is because of the kill switch embedded inside him when he created him. They have to get the passcode to disable that tech so they can use regular healing devices on him, which once they get the password later and activated means that any time in the future, it's not going to be a problem. Like Rocket can just heal himself normally using med packs now going forward in Marvel movies. Rocket has another flashback to when he met Lila, Teefs, and Floor for the first time. This is right after he gains the ability to speak. They also explained they had three different voice actors for Rocket during his different ages, which is different from the way they do Groot. Even when he was baby Groot, it was still Vin Diesel. They just modulate his voice a little bit so it sounds higher or lower, depending on how old Groot is. All of Rocket's friends are from the comics. They appear in Rocket Raccoon solo comics as part of his backstory, but their origin in the comics was a little bit different. In the MCU, they're all creations of the High Evolutionary, but in the comics, Rocket came from a place called Half-World, which was ruled by people called the Game Masters. They had an Easter egg for that during the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie in their prison lineup. I think the story in the MCU is that after he escaped High Evolutionary, Half-World was where he went next and lived for a time before he met Groot and joined the Guardians. Speaking of which, another big surprise, James Gunn revealed that the main plot of this movie with Rocket's backstory was originally supposed to be a Rocket and Groot spin-off movie that he developed way back when they were first making the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. They don't really explore Groot's origin during this movie or any of the other movies for that matter, but original Groot from the first movie met Rocket after he'd been banished by his people, just like he did in the comics, that was their backstory in the comics, which are called Flora Colossus. Maybe some future movie will cover Groot's origin story. There's still another elder of the universe called the Gardener, who in the comics has a connection with the Groot character. Maybe they'll use that character in the future to tell Groot's backstory. The other major Easter egg here with Rocket's childhood friends is that Lila the Otter was voiced by Linda Cardellini, who also plays Hawkeye's wife, Laura Barton. She's also Agent 47, aka Mockingbird, of the MCU. And in the comics, the other difference is that Lila was more like Rocket's girlfriend. In the movie, she's more like a very, very close friend that he cared deeply about. They find out that Rocket's medical records are held at Orgo Corp's headquarters, which they call the Orthoscope or the Orgo, the place that looks kind of like a giant celestial butthole. Orgo is a Marvel character, but there's no comic book connection to this version of the Orgo Corp. I think James Gunn just created it brand new for the movie. The soldiers, like Nathan Fillion's character, are called Orgo Sentries. They also mostly use this location for a lot of comedy, which is why I think there's a lot of tongue-in-cheek jokes, especially with the way they visualize it. When they head out to save Rocket, their new uniforms are also based on the ones they wore during the Annihilation comic book run, which was the story where this version of the Guardians team came together for the first time, and they had a lot of elements from that story in the movie, like they based a lot of the movie on that run, like Adam Warlock and Phi Lavelle joined the Guardians team during that story, which they do at the end of this movie. They explain that in the MCU, High Evolutionary uses legitimate business profits from his genetic engineering experiments through OrgoCorp, science and tech they create through genetic research to fund his illegal experiments in genetic tampering, which he does outside parts of space that people are able to police. So the idea is that he's super powerful, but he's not so powerful that he can do whatever he wants to inside Kree Empire space or Asgardian space, so you get the idea. It does look like a giant celestial butthole, but Orgoscorp sounds a lot like Orthoscorp, which is a device used on eyes, so you could say it resembles a giant celestial eyeball too. But the real explanation is that the entire place is bioengineered, as are all their weapons, their tech, their armor. Essentially, it's just another research path that High Evolutionary pursued in his quest for perfection, like why don't we experiment with organic tech? 
Real good example of this is that all over the base they have security cameras, but the cameras are organic so they're giant eyeballs instead of cameras. The other funny thing too is that the armor that they're all wearing kind of seems like ball sack skin. Like all the characters, everything about this place is just used for a comedy. They bring back the Ravagers and Sylvester Stallone's Starhawk character as well as his original Guardians 3000 team from the comics, Yondu's original team. They explain that after Yondu's death and Taserface's death in the second movie, Starhawk seized control of the Ravagers and Gamora has basically been working for him as part of their larger crew. Peter Quill also says in the movie that he's still kind of a Ravager, like I'm more of a Ravager than you are, Gamora, but the Ravagers are mostly a disparate group of teams that have a loose affiliation and a leader who can tell them what to do or bring them together when is needed. It's just that Peter Quill doesn't consider himself an active member of the Ravagers currently. The same way at the end of the movie, some of the Guardians aren't active members of the team. Like, we're taking a break for a little while. The next big Easter egg is for the mainframe character, also part of that Guardians 3000 team from the second movie in the comics. In the Guardians of the Galaxy 2, she was voiced by Miley Cyrus, but in this movie, they recast her with Tara Strong, who's also the voice of Miss Minutes in the Loki series. Kruger is back from Starhawk's team. He's a sorcerer, just like Doctor Strange, who would have the same abilities. He also trained at Kamartage at some point in the past and then left. That's why his magical energy, his portals, are the exact same as Doctor Strange's and Wong's. There's a lot of different magic users in the MCU, but a lot of them practice very different forms of magic, wielding different types of magical energy, like Scarlet Witch uses Chaos Magic, which is red, Loki's magic is green, Agatha Harkness's magic is purple, Dormammu's dark magic is red. Michael Rosenbaum comes back as Martin X. They also change the special effects for his face so that it looks a little bit more like his real face. We find out that Blurp is also a member of the Ravagers crew too, who winds up being kind of like Adam Warlock's new pet and a member of Rocket's Guardians team. You also probably recognize a couple of their cameos. Molly Quinn is from the Castle TV show where she played Nathan Fillion's daughter. James Gunn actually introduced her to her partner Elon Gale, who produces the F-Boy Island TV show, he does a lot of reality TV, who is also friends with separately, who also has a cameo as another Ravager later in the movie. Nathan Fillion, obviously also in this movie, who James Gunn has been friends with for a long time, trying to put him in all of his Guardians movies. So the other joke here is that James Gunn just puts a lot of his friends and real life family members in his movies. They also have this running gag between Nebula and Gamora and their relationship as sisters where they just communicate with each other through grunts and they just each understand each other even though everybody else just sees it as grunts like they totally get what they're talking about. Rocket has another flashback to the time he discovered how to fix High Evolutionary's problem with aggression and his experiments and when he writes the complex equation on the blackboard there's a real deep cut easter egg here for James Gunn's initial pitch for the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie that he gave to Kevin Feige. He said that when he was working on the first movie, very early on, he sketched Rocket doing this on a blackboard, sent it to Kevin Feige as sort of a proof of concept art, which they wound up turning into one of the posters for Guardians of the Galaxy 3. When he says the music they're listening to is from ancient Earth about 5,000 years ago, it'd have to be from one of Earth's early cultures in real life, like ancient Sumerians. He says he visited Earth not too long ago. They never state how old he is, but in the comics, he was born a human on Earth originally in present day. Then he became obsessed with reaching biological perfection and kept upgrading himself and experimenting on other life forms like we see in the movie. I think the idea is that in the MCU, this version of the character came from another world and just visited Earth in the past. In the way he says that he got the idea for Counter Earth to make a more perfect version of Earth is similar to the backstory in the comics of Counter Earth. There was an easter egg for him during Guardians of the Galaxy 2. When they crash land on the planet Burhurt, that's meant to be an anagram for Herbert Edgar Wyndham, which is High Evolutionary's real name before he started calling himself High Evolutionary in the comics. Young Rocket sees Counter-Earth, which is still under construction at the time. When he sees the rocket, it gives him the idea to name himself Rocket later. When he tells Rocket his experiments are halfway there, I think that's also a reference to Rocket's origin story in the comics on Half-World. The experiment when he tests out his evolution on a turtle seems kind of like a sly Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles reference. And the other thing going on here is that Rocket solving his evolution problem is revealing that Rocket is actually a genius. And if it wasn't clear in previous movies, Rocket created Nebula's new arm as well. So even though they joke about Rocket getting Winter Soldier's arm during the holiday special, like I'm gonna get me that arm, then Nebula gets him that arm by literally ripping it off a Winter Soldier in the middle of the night. James Gunn actually talked about this. He said that it's actually canon now, like, oh, that's canon. 
Rocket probably could have created an arm just like that on his own if he had access to vibranium, which he doesn't because it's so rare in the universe. Now, if James Gunn says that that's canon, that he has his arm now, we'll see how they explain that during the Thunderbolts movie when Winter Soldier comes back, but maybe Peter Quill took the arm back to him when he came back to Earth at the end of the movie. When the Guardians finally jump onto the Orgo through space, their spacesuits are meant to be a reference to the spacesuits from the 2001 Space Odyssey movie. A lot of younger people who were watching trailer videos thought it might be an Among Us reference, but James Gunn was like, no, 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 not Among Us, it's 2001 reference. The other Easter egg going on here too, low level, is that they're all different colors of the Infinity Stones, but there's only five of them and there are six Infinity Stones. The song that plays while this is happening is Space Hogs in the meantime. The other joke reference you could draw here is that one of the characters in the movie is called War Pig, so there is literally a Space Hog in the movie. Adam Warlock winds up ripping his head right off. We meet Nathan Fillion's character, leader of the Orgo Sentries. James Gunn has put him in all of his Guardians of the Galaxy movies, but some of his roles wound up being really cool deleted scenes. In the first movie, he played the alien as a voiceover actor who harassed Peter Quill in the prison. During Guardians 2, he played a version of Wonder Man, aka Simon Williams. The scene would have been a movie festival based on his fake in-universe movies that he had made, all of which were either references to other Marvel characters like Iron Man or some references to Marvel comic book characters like Conan the Barbarian and Archon, and in some cases, the movies were just parodies of real-life movies. In the comics, Wonder Man's cover identity is being a Hollywood actor when he's not busy being a superhero. They're making a Wonder Man TV show for Disney Plus right now. They've cast most of the actors. They're going to be filming pretty soon. During Guardians 2, James Gunn wound up just completely getting rid of the scene. It's just a deleted scene. It would have happened in the St. Louis parts of the movie where the movie goes to show Ego the Living Planet C growing. That's also where Peter Quill is from, St. Louis, where Ego met his mother. St. Louis is also where James Gunn is from in real life. His real life parents actually had a cameo scene during that part of the movie. There was also an Easter egg for his parents during Guardians 3 as well too. At the end of the movie, the actual end credits are just scrolling through different pictures taken from images in other Guardians movies and other appearances, and one of them is of his parents' cameo scene. The movie is also dedicated to his father, James Gunn Sr., who passed away in 2020. In the context of this movie, Nathan Fillion is just a regular security guard who hates the men that work for him because one of them's an idiot, which he references several times. Also, when he's making fun of Adam Warlock, like, oh, you got an idiot with you. I got one of those too. There's a cameo scene from James Gunn's wife in real life who plays one of the office workers. She also plays Amelia Harcourt in all of the DC movies and has appeared in a bunch of crossovers lately in the DC universe, like the Suicide Squad movie, Peacemaker, Black Adam. She just appeared in the Shazam Fury of the Gods post credit scene. Nathan Fillion was also in the Suicide Squad movie as a character. There was another DC character in this too. Daniela Melchior, who plays Ratcatcher 2 during Suicide Squad, also starred as the office worker that Peter Quill tries to seduce. They have a real quick joke about a dude whose head looks like a carrot that Gamora almost kills. He's not a character from Marvel Comics, but there is a non-Marvel character whose head is an actual carrot. During the elevator ride, Peter Quill recaps pretty much the entire events of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, Avengers Infinity War, Avengers Endgame. He calls Gamora's death on Vormir the magic cliff, saying that he doesn't understand how time travel worked during Avengers Endgame and references all the Infinity Stones. Her dad threw her off a magic cliff and she died, and then I lost my temper and nearly destroyed half the universe. And she came back out of the past. There she is. Everyone else who died in the past stayed dead. Not her. Why? Was it the magic cliff? I don't know. That's some freaking Infinity Stone scientist. When he says he lost his temper and almost accidentally destroyed half the universe, that's a joke about messing up with their fight against Thanos, allowing him to escape and snap the full Infinity Gauntlet. James Gunn actually talked about this in real life. He said that he hated that part of Infinity War, Star-Lord botching things, and claimed that had he written Star-Lord's part, it wouldn't have gone down like that. He said that his version of Star-Lord, like as he writes the character, would have killed Gamora when she asked him to, preventing Thanos from getting the Soul Stone in the first place. Which also, side note, confirms James Gunn had no part in writing any of the Guardian scenes during Infinity War or Endgame. And speaking of Infinity Stones and Celestials, one thing the movie doesn't really get into that much is whether or not the High Evolutionary had tried to use Celestials or Celestial Tech to obtain any Infinity Stones in the past for his experiments. So I would assume, yes, he did try or acquire some Celestial Tech at some point. 
Also because in the comics, he had the Soul Stone and gave it to Adam Warlock, so there's a big association with his character, Infinity Stones and Celestials. Rocket has another flashback to the time he and his friends gave themselves names, Floor because the rabbit was lying on the floor, Teeths because the walrus had giant teeth. Lila doesn't say why she chooses that name, but Rocket explains that he chose that name because of his dream to use a rocket to take them away where they could live a happy life together. They start the face-off jokes to set up the end of the movie when they head to Count to Earth. Face-off is meant to be a reference to a couple things. Their final fight against High Evolutionary, his face actually coming off literally. They reveal that during Rocket's initial escape, he clawed off his face completely and afterwards he just attached it over his head, which is why it looks so weird, like Robocop's face, which Peter Quill references later. Also, when he calls him Skeletor, that's another reference to him not really having a face because Skeletor doesn't have an actual face. It's also meant to be a reference to the Nicolas Cage, John Travolta face-off movie because that's literally the plot of the movie, them taking off and replacing their actual faces. Adam Warlock winds up picking up Blurp and taking him as a pet from the Orgo after he accidentally kills the Ravager that he was there with. Also, James Gunn's wife, I'm not sure what her character's name is during the movie, is seen eating a carrot-like food, which is a callback to the joke about Gamora almost killing the carrot head. Rocket has another flashback setting up his escape where he meets Batch 90, who are meant to be the animals that we meet later living on Counter Earth, which the High Evolutionary also subsequently winds up destroying, so press F to pay respects to them. In present day, the Guardians arrive on Counter Earth, and it's meant to be what it basically is in the comics a perfect replica of Earth, but supposed to be better, frozen kind of in the 1980s within this movie version. You notice he's replaced the Statue of Liberty with his own likeness holding a monkey. In the comics, he started out on Earth because he was a human, then felt like he hit the limit of what he could do there with his experiments and created Counter-Earth to be a more perfect version of Earth where he could continue that without the superheroes like the Avengers getting in his way. And just like in the movie, Counter-Earth of the comics winds up being not perfect with homelessness, drugs, violent crime, and he decides to destroy it and try again. In the comics, Similar thing happens, Man-Beast takes over the planet and he upgrades Adam Warlock with the Soul Stone and has him defeat Man-Beast and get rid of his problems to pacify the planet. Love all the 80s jokes here too, just the mise-en-scene, like everything frozen in the 1980s and all the jokes that Drax has about trying to use the couch to sleep on. Why doesn't it have dual purposes? Why is it shaped like this if we're not supposed to sleep on it? In both Peter Quill and Nebula, not totally understanding how to work the 80s technology car. Like, how do you get in? How do you press this button? And he doesn't know how to drive because he left Earth when he was eight years old. So he never actually learned how to drive a car like this. We meet Phi Lavelle for the first time. She becomes the next Quasar in the comics. That's what they're teasing in this movie within the context of the MCU. She's meant to be the latest evolution of that particular race of children. The same way that Adam Warlock was the apex version of the Sovereign race. All of her powers are similar to the powers that she has in the comics. She doesn't have the quantum bands yet, but at the end of the movie, you do see her giving off energy. She does have that ability before she gets the quantum bands in the comics. She's meant to be naturally very powerful. The quantum bands just make her ultra, ultra powerful. They're meant to be kind of like Miss Marvel's Kree Nega bands, which they actually just confirmed in the Marvel's trailer. They revealed that the Kree bands from the comics. Phi Lavelle is also from the Captain Marvel comics. She's basically meant to be an artificial copy of Genus Vell, the actual son of the original Captain Marvel character. Their mother is meant to be an Eternal from the planet Titan, just like Thanos. She's the same type of Eternal, so they're both super powerful. Their children become ultra powerful as well. When they arrive at High Evolutionary Ship, War Pig here is played by Judy Greer, who also plays Ant-Man's ex-wife. A lot of dual role happening in the MCU. Then they flash back to the events of Rocket's escape, the death of Lila, all of his friends, him clawing off High Evolutionary's face. And in present day, he winds up inadvertently killing Ayesha when he detonates the entire planet counter Earth, Adam Warlock's surrogate mother, in front of his eyes, giving him the same tragic origin story that Peter Quill had, seeing his mother die before his eyes. It's meant to be the event that sort of turns Adam Warlock towards the Guardian side, but also on top of that is Groot saving his life. Like, why did you do that? Why were you nice to me? And that sort of turns him around. Rocket winds up dying briefly before they're able to fully heal him with the right codes. And while he's dead, they sort of pull a Harry Potter Deathly Hallows moment where in that movie, while Harry Potter's dead briefly, he meets Dumbledore's spirit who gives him a call to action. And Rocket has a similar moment with Lila's spirit who tells him it's not his time yet. The place that Rocket is speaking to Lila is sort of like a cosmic version of the original place where they were kept in cages. 
when he winds up coming back to life, he proves the others on the comms he's still alive. They all share a moment together, which they use for another Gamora and Groot talking joke where she just says, you're just making up what he's saying, right? Like, it's all just nonsense. Setting at the end of the movie where he actually does speak a full sentence. Peter Quill yells a bunch of 80s pop culture references at High Evolutionary, making fun of him for his Robocop face because the way it's stretched over his head, he man the Masters of the Universe Skeletor because he doesn't have an actual face. Confirming that Peter Quill would have watched Masters of the Universe, the He-Man TV show cartoon back in the 80s. Purple Nurple is also just a prank where you twist people's nipples till their skin turns purple because his costume is purple. When he calls for Kraglin's help on Nowhere, the other Ravagers there are playing cards. Cosmo explains the rest of her origin story, which is pretty similar to the origin story in the comics. She's based on the Russian space dog from real life called Laika, who they tested their early space rockets on. In the MCU, in 1966, the Soviets did pretty much the same thing with Cosmo, only she wound up being bombarded with cosmic rays, which gave her her powers, and she wound up on Nowhere as part of the Collector's Collection. She speaks using the voice box tech, which is also from the comics. They bring back Howard Duck, who doesn't really have that much of a speaking role, but there's another cameo from Lloyd Kaufman's Ravager's character. He cameoed in the previous Guardians movies. In real life, James Gunn's first job in Hollywood when he was young was working at Troma Films for Lloyd Kaufman, who served as like an early mentor to him. The broker is back from the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Apparently he's living on nowhere now. They also reveal that they can actually fly nowhere around like a giant ship. It has thrusters and they've added weapons to it in the eye socket. Because it probably cost them a fortune to fix nowhere up and just keep it running because they destroy it so many times, I'm assuming they just continue to sell off all the celestial DNA that they continue to mine that you saw during the first movie. That stuff will be worth a fortune. They reveal High Evolutionary throws Nebula, Drax, and Mantis to a bunch of abolist creatures like the one in the second movie, and Mantis winds up making friends with them using her powers. At the end of the movie, she even leaves nowhere with them as if they become her pets. Drax also reveals that he can speak Phyla Vell's language. They don't explain why he can do that. I think part of what's going on with his character, they kind of imply this during the movie, James Gunn's trying to say that he's neurodivergent, so his brain just processes things a little differently, and it comes off as him being autistic, but it allows him to understand this weird foreign language like it's no big deal. High Evolutionary releases his Hell Spawn, which are basically just like his failed creations that he's turned into weapons like his support army. When they attack Nowhere, Kraglin has a vision of Yondu giving him a call to action, like a little pep talk, and he uses his fin and arrow finally, correctly, and along with Cosmo, defeats most of the others, calling her a good doggo before she uses her telekinesis to smash one of them. Peter Quill cues up the Beastie Boys' No Sleep Till Brooklyn song as they have their epic version of a Daredevil-style hallway fight scene, probably the best hallway fight scene that they've done in any of the Marvel movies so far. We'll see if they top that in any of the future ones. Expecting to see a lot of really cool hallway fight scenes in the future of Daredevil in the MCU. They wind up rescuing all the kids, all the animals that were left there, and Groot rescues Adam Warlock, winning him over to the team, after which he rescues Peter Quill. There was a super quick James Gunn cameo during this part of the movie too. He actually did the voice for this fleshy looking lump of alien that they rescue that Mantis freaks out when she sees. Oh, I wasn't yelling at you. I was yelling at something behind you. They have that moment where Rocket actually finds out that he is a real raccoon and uses his original keycard to rescue all of his descendants, like his other relative raccoons here that are still regular raccoons. That all the Guardians of the Galaxy defeat High Evolutionary, revealing his messed up face, which is a comic book reference. In the comics, he has that red looking face, like he doesn't have an actual face because he's messed it up so badly with all the upgrades and experiments he's performed on himself. In the MCU, obviously, it was Rocket just clawing his face off. And if it wasn't clear, Rocket actually leaves him alive at the end of the movie. So potentially, even though his ship blew up, it's possible they survived. Like it's a comic book movie. So if you don't see a body, they probably survived. When they go back and things chill out, Peter Quill says goodbye to Gamora. They don't wind up together, but he finally makes peace with her original death and they become friends. Like he's friends with this version of the character. Zoe Saldana also said that this was her last Marvel movie ever, but we'll see about that. Like, don't hold your breath. Dave Batista also said the same thing, too. Peter Quill decides to go back to Earth and spend time with his grandfather after finally making peace with his mother's death. Mantis also takes a break from the team to just explore the galaxy on her own. Drax agrees to take care of all the children that they rescued, like be a father to them. Nebula also becomes administrator of Nowhere. 
Rocket becomes captain of the new Guardians team, and Groot finally says that full sentence, I love you guys, blowing all their minds, my theater went crazy too, like, oh my god, he's actually talking. Then paying off the beginning of the movie, Peter Quill leaves Rocket, his Zune, with a note written on his ALF TV show stationery, more 80s stuff, something he's kept in his backpack. They have a dance-off celebration, which is another reference to the dance-off from the first movie. Peter Quill arrives at his grandfather's house on Earth. The woman that answers the door is the person that he remarried to while he was gone, and this is the first time that he's seen his grandfather since he left in the 80s. There are two post-credit scenes. The first post-credit scene reveals the brand new Guardians of the Galaxy team. Rocket leading the team, Groot, who's evolved again into like the Giga Chad version of himself. He looks more like King Groot from the comics and the games with a big crown on his head. Kraglin, who's finally gotten good at using Yondu's fin in his arrow weapon. Then Cosmo the Space Dog, who we saw working with the team in the holiday special. And the totally new members replacing the ones who also left are Adam Warlock. In the comics, he became a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy team during Annihilation, and then later in the comics, he's continuing his quest to understand reality, people, morality just in general, kind of like Vision did after Avengers Age of Ultron. The next new member is Phyla Vell, who's kind of like the new version of Quasar from the comics, or will become Quasar in the future. As far as I can tell, she doesn't have the quantum bands yet, so I think that will be like some future story that they can tell in other Marvel movies. The last new member of the new Guardians roster is Blurp, who's another one of the High Evolutionary's creations that they rescue. There's been a bunch of jokes about him in all the trailers, too. And during the post credit scene, the new Guardians team is on a planet getting ready to protect a group of townspeople from an invading army of animals, but they're sitting around casually just joking with each other about who their favorite music bands are. Phyla Vell says her favorites are Britney Spears and Korn, which are like two diametrically opposite tones of bands, like completely different. Craglin says his favorite music is The Man, Garth Brooks the country singer. He really likes the classics. Cosmo says that she's never heard a bad song from the Carpenters, but Adam Warlock's favorite music band is Adrian Ballou, who was a guitarist who ended up working with King Crimson, who go back to the 60s. They're like a prog rock group. In Rocket says his favorite song is actually huge Easter egg from the original Come and Get Your Love Redbone song at the very beginning of the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. He says this one's kind of special, then cues up the song to play on Star-Lord's Zune, which he gave to Rocket when he left the team to go back to Earth. They joke about who's going to be the one to defeat the invading army for the town. Like, oh no, I'll do it, I'll do it. Like, it's no big deal. Kraglin says he'll do it by himself just because they treat it like it's not a big deal. Rocket says they should all do it together just so that it goes faster, and then he bumps Groot, who's been lying down, taking a nap. He rolls over and is super huge, like I said, the Giga Chad version of Groot now. And as they start running towards the army of animals, the music swells up, come and get your love, and it slams to credits with the song playing. Probably not coming back till Avengers 5 King Dynasty or Avengers 6 Secret Wars. After that, they probably won't do Guardians of the Galaxy 4 as a movie because Disney said they're not doing fourth sequels anymore for any of these movies, but the team will just keep crossing over with other space-based movies. The second post credit scene is a funny scene of Star-Lord who's gone back to Earth now to live with his grandfather, who we saw in the first movie. And in the actual scene, he's just jokingly talking to his grandfather about Kevin Bacon being super weird and casual everyday problems like mowing the lawn. Very mundane, regular human problems. And it's meant to be a sign that he's finally found some peace and doesn't have any universe-ending threats that he's worried about at the current moment. His grandfather is reading the newspaper, which has the headline about Kevin Bacon being abducted by aliens, which is another holiday special reference. But a lot of people also think because Secret Invasion is coming up, and the whole idea that it's all about alien infiltration, the school's infiltrating and taking over Earth's culture, that could be a reference to Secret Invasion. If you spotted any other Easter eggs or references in the movie that I didn't mention in this video or my post credit scene video, just write them below in the comments. There's a thousand things like you could watch this movie 10 more times and still find brand new stuff. And I will do more bonus videos this weekend. So if there's anything that you really want me to do a video about, let me know in the comments. Congratulations to the giveaway winner from that last big Guardians video, Vernal Thoughts. Please email me on the about page of my channel so I can get your contact details. Everyone click here for my Guardians of the Galaxy 3 post credit scene video and click here for my brand new Secret Invasion trailer video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.